Good evening. My name is Emily Underwood. I'm the Community Initiative Specialist at the Missouri Historical Society. And I wanted to thank you for being here with us this evening and welcome you to this installment of STL History Live featuring Watching the River Roll By, the music and legacy of John Hartford. The Missouri Historical Society hosts two STL Live uh, programs every week. Uh, that's in addition, those are, I'm sorry, those are on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. And that's in addition to our bi-weekly Soldiers Memorial Chow and Chat programs, as well as our new temporary series, How Did We Get Here?, which explores issues of race in St. Louis. So be sure to check out the full uh, programming lineup. You can do that on our website, mohistory.org, or you can find that under the events listing on the Missouri Historical History Museum Facebook page. Um, at this point, I do want to just take a moment to express a little bit of gratitude. I first want to say thank you to all of our members um, for all of the support you give us now and always and <laughs> keep these programs running. Um, we really appreciate that. If you're not a member, but you're interested in learning about it, I did post a link in the chat so you can click on that and get a little bit more information. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Zoo Museum Tax District and everyone in the St. Louis region for your tax contributions. And also, I would like to recognize all of the sponsors of the Mining Mississippi exhibit, um, which was the inspiration for today's program. Uh, it really is a beautiful exhibit that puts the grandeur of North America's greatest river in context with the cultures um, that have grown and thrived around it. And the History Museum and the Mining Missis Mississippi exhibit are both open right now. They're open to visitors Wednesdays through Sundays um, with free reservations. So be sure to visit and uh, make plans to see that. Just a couple quick things before we get started. Um, after the presentation, we will have some time for Q&A, so um, be sure to post your questions in the Q&A feature in your toolbar. And uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as we can in the time that we have, <clears throat> excuse me. And also, if you're interested in revisiting this program at any point or sharing it with friends, you can find it on our YouTube channel. That's the Missouri History Museum uh, Historical Society YouTube channel, and it will be posted there on Monday. Um, and then the final request I have of you is that at some point during this program, you're going to notice a tab popping up in your browser that has a little bit of a survey on it. Just takes a couple minutes, but we really do appreciate your feedback and we really do take it to heart and use it as we plan our programming. So we really appreciate you uh, taking a minute or two to do that. So we're going to get on with the program. As I mentioned before, this program was inspired by the Mining Mississippi exhibit. And we knew that we wanted to do a John Hartford program. So we thought, who do we call? We call KDHX and the KDHX Folk School. And if you're not familiar with the Folk School, I did actually put a link for them in the chat as well. I highly recommend that you go visit their website. The mission of the Folk School is to build community by providing educational programs that promote learning, teaching, renewal, and perpetuation of traditional music and folk arts. And it does that through classes and jam sessions and workshops for people of all ages and backgrounds and skill levels. Um, so a little bit of something for everyone. Um, so we reached out and connected with our program host this evening, Kelly Wells, who is the executive director at KDHX. She's a musician herself as well. And I'm paraphrasing, but basically she said, John Hartford, I got this. And uh, she definitely had it for sure. And she put together a really lovely program for you tonight. Um, it features a bit of an interview she did with John Hotze, who's a John Hartford friend and expert, as well as some musical selections. Um, and I promise I won't make you wait for it any longer. So I'll just say thank you again, and I'll make myself scarce and turn it over to Kelly Wells. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, so much. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, as Emily said, my name is Kelly Wells. I'm the Executive Director of KDHX and the Folk School of KDHX. And I'm also the host of Steam Powered Radio, which airs on Wednesdays on KDHX, 88.1 FM, uh, on, from 10 until noon. KDHX, of course, is St. Louis's own independent non-commercial music radio station. Um, and Steam Powered Radio, my radio show you might have surmised uh, is named after the John Hartford song Steam Powered Area Plane. I'm not gonna lie I have been doing my show for seven years and on a very regular basis while I'm on air I almost say Steam Powered Area Plane instead of Steam Powered Radio and uh, that's just a testament to how much John's music can uh, can influence and, and infiltrate. Um, but I am thrilled to be here uh, with the Missouri History Museum and, and Emily I was thrilled when they asked and I'm also thrilled to be 
talking about one of my very favorite subjects, well, really two of my very favorite subjects, uh, John Hartford and the Mississippi River. I grew up on the Mississippi River. My father's family is from the Mississippi Delta. I was raised uh, a good bit of my growing up years in Memphis and then also have lived in New Orleans and now I'm in St. Louis. So I have not spent as much time exploring, of course, the Mississippi River as John Hartford did. Um, but I definitely understand the allure that it had for him, that, that grounding of a natural resource like the river. I feel like wherever I've gone in life, I always kind of know where I am in relation to where that big old muddy Mississippi River runs. So um, I certainly understand the kinship that Hartford had with it. Um, tonight, I uh, the reason I got this, as Emily says, is um, because I just had a wonderful experience in getting to gather folks together who know more about John Hartford than I do, and we're so happy to share what they know of him and also happy to share their music with you. So yes, we have an interview with St. Louis native John Hotze, a longtime friend of John Hartford's. We have archival footage of John Hartford, and then we have some artists that are going to showcase some John Hartford songs for you. So I'm very thankful to all of them for participating this evening. I'm mostly going to let the artists and the friends and the music do the talking, but I will tell you just a little bit about John Hartford as we get started. So John Cowan Hartford was born in 1937. Uh, he grew up in St. Louis, and because we are in St. Louis, I will tell you that he attended John Burroughs High School. Um, and he went on, he started playing music at a pretty early age, but he went on to become one of the quintessential bluegrass and folk musicians of his time. And the legacy that he left for generations to come is still resounding through uh, the music world. Um, I often contemplate the effect that Hartford had, kind of that reason that uh, his music resonated so much with people. And I've come to realize just the freedom that John Hartford gave us all. And, and by that, I mean, um, he valued and he lauded his musical heroes, uh, people like Bill Monroe, people like Flat and Scruggs, uh, but he also kind of eschewed the rules. He, he, he said, you know, I take your rules and I raise you the freedom to throw that rule book out the out the window. And yes, there are rules in bluegrass country and old time music, even though it may not seem like it. But he threw those rules out the window and he said, be your authentic self in the music. And I think that's what he really did is that he was his authentic self uh, in that music. And it may not seem like it as we think about it now, but at the time it was, and it still is uh, very profound. Um, Hartford said, I do the best I can that's how it comes out. I believe that style is created by my limitations. My limitations are what define my style. My art is a struggle for me to reproduce the sounds I hear inside my head and communicate them to the listener. Let's just say that I'm always trying to overcome my limitations. I think my life is working hard at getting better at what I do. At once, he was silly, he was nostalgic, he was innovative, he, and rooted through music. John Hartford told the stories that he knew, and many of those stories were rooted in his love of the Mississippi River. He goes on to say, I've tried to collect songs that I think are river songs for one reason or another. There's a certain element of music which seems typical of the river area. Old time music and the fiddle and the banjo is very much river music going all the way back to the flatboat days. The old flat boats and lee boats and raft boats that floated the river carried a fiddler as part of the crew for morale and to ease the workload. A fiddle tune and a little bit of whiskey could keep a man on the pole for a long time. To sing us a John Harvard song about the river and uh, the, the song that I named this presentation for, I'm very proud to present Kansas City musicians Betsy Ellis and Clark Wyatt. Betsy and Clark have both studied and have loved John Hartford's music. And they're going to do a wonderful rendition here of Watching the River Roll By, which was recorded by Hartford on his 1999 album, Good Old Boys. So here we go with Betsy and Clark.
Kelly, the sound is not coming through. We worked just fine when we tested this earlier, but it's not coming through right now. Can we pause the video and see if we can? Folks, we're going to see if we can get this fixed. I know a few of you have put a comment in the chat or the Q&A that you're not hearing it. We're going to see if we can fix that. You're still muted right now. Okay, folks, I'm so sorry. That one was on me. I've, I just clicked the wrong button. You should be able to hear it now. Let's hope so. Here we go. Betsy and Clark. Living by the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri rivers in Kansas City, we feel connected to the movement of the water and the songs of John Hartford that take us down the river always make us feel both at home and on an adventure. Sweet. 
sometimes till way past ten and I just watch the river go by watching the river roll by watching the river go by in the evening they're just watching the river go by watching the river go by watching the river roll by in the evening now they didn't do this in the dead of winter and they didn't do it in the dead of summer either because they didn't want to freeze or get bitten by mosquitoes <laughs> but some nights it'd be just right and she'd show up in her bathrobe and they'd just sit in the dark going and watching the river roll by watching the river roll by watching the river roll by in the evening Watching the river roll by, watching the river roll by in the evening. Watching the river roll by, watching the river roll by, watching the river roll by in the evening. Just watching the river roll by, watching the river roll by, watching the river roll by in the evening. That was Betsy and Clark from Kansas City, Missouri, performing Hartford's Watching the River Roll By. You can find out more about Betsy and Clark by visiting BetsyandClark.com. About a week ago, I got to have a wonderful, oh, 45 minutes or so conversation with St. Louis native John Hotze, who is one of Hartford's longtime friends, as in they've known each other since they were teenagers and played music together uh, even then. Um, and John has done a ton to perpetuate the legacy of John Hartford. Um, he is the founder of the John Hartford Memorial Festival that is held annually at the Bill Monroe Musical Campground in Bean Blossom, Indiana. And I am so grateful that John was willing to uh, brave the tech and to uh, join me in an, an interview video interview so that uh, we could share with you some of what he knows of John Hartford and of his time knowing John Hartford for nearly 60 years. So John, thank you so much. I'm excited to uh, for folks to hear the stories that you have to tell. So here is John Hotze. I had a very good friend, uh, Paul Breidenbach, and myself, we, we were both into country music. And Paul worked up there at the Murdoch and Big Ben selling newspapers on Saturday night. And I would spend, you know, probably a couple hours up there with, with uh, Paul, just talking country music, talking about the Grand Ole Opry. And anyway, Paul and I decided, hey, why don't we ask our parents if we can go down to Nashville and, and see the Wendell Lapper? Yeah. Well, well, it was kind of a joke to begin with that that would be a possibility when we were both, I don't know, 13 or 14 years old. But it turned out we, uh, we talked to, the, to our parents and we wound up buying tickets. So we attended what was a Friday night frolic or Friday night opera, as they call it today. That was just a block or two up the street from the Ryman at the uh, WSM National Life and Accident Insurance Building. And up there at the, I think it was the third floor, was a studio that uh, I guess it held about 100 people, maybe 150. I don't, it wasn't all that big, but that's where the Friday Night Frolic was. Well, what I'm getting to was that's where we met John and uh, got to talking and finding out that uh, 
John just lived a few miles from us back in St. Louis. And uh, so it was just kind of a natural thing that we decided to exchange phone numbers and get together. Another thing it, um, that was unusual back then, and I'd say 1954, 55, when we, it was probably closer to 55 we met John. It was just uh, unusual to meet somebody that liked uh, bluegrass music. And John was really into bluegrass. <laughs> In the next few weeks, uh, John and I uh, got together on the phone and we decided let's, let's get together because I knew he played and I played a little bit of guitar and, and Paul also played guitar. So uh, we get we got together and started. Uh, John was uh, uh, mainly banjo playing as far as what he did with me. Mm -hmm. He did play the fiddle sometimes, but it was mainly, mainly the banjo. One thing that uh, uh, I also had a connection with John as far as uh, our friendship went is I was, uh, at that time, I was recording mainly Bill Monroe and Flatt and Scruggs and uh, live shows off of the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday night. As you know, here in St. Louis, it's we're 300 miles away, so it wasn't always perfect. But if you waited until after you know after the sun went down and got dark, you could get sometimes a pretty good signal. So I, I had a, a lot of good recordings of uh, Platinum Scruggs and Bill Monroe and John was a fanatic uh, on Earl Scruggs. I guess he, he actually became, uh, I think, the president of the fan club for... Uh, That's great. Platt and Scruggs, or maybe it was just Earl Scruggs, I'm not sure. But uh, he was the president of the Midwest uh, part of that uh, fan mm -hmm. club. And anyway, John, uh, every time we get together, John would always want to know what you got new. You got something new from the Opry that we can listen to. So I provided him with uh, a lot of uh, recordings of, of uh, Flat and Scruggs for him to practice with and learn some new stuff. We, we actually went down to the Opry uh, together a couple times. I remember Remember, I drove and uh, one of the trips I do remember was uh, uh, oh, this Lee, a fiddler out in Winsfield, I forget his first name, uh, and Paul and John and I drove down to, to Nashville together. So we attended the opera and uh, a couple times uh, we, d we did some other things. We went up to watch uh, Flatten Swords do their TV show. I think we took a taxi. It <laughs> was, uh, must have been maybe a time that I hadn't dri drove. It it was on a bus. But anyway, I remember what just uh, just blew my mind when I think about it today. After the show was over, TV show was over, Earl Scruggs uh, said, you boys want, want to ride back to the uh, opera? I, you know, he assumed that we were going to the opera. So we wound up uh, in Earl Scruggs' car driving back to the Ryman Auditorium. And, you know, for a 15-year-old kid in love with the music, that was phenomenal. 
I think back upon the you know the years sixty five years ago with John, and he really was a, a fairly ordinary person to me. Mm-hmm. I um, I can say that I I think I could say that I knew he was a very strong willed person. If he was determined to do something, you you betcha that he would eventually figure a way of getting it done. His endowment and his love for music certainly stood out. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I wanted to honor John is that I felt like he had a lot of good music to uh, that new generations have never heard that they right. they wouldn't know anything about John, and I thought having a festival would be a good way to bring in some of the younger generations that uh, to get to know who John was. Yep. And you know, eight nine years down the road, it looks like it's worked. I think I probably introduced John to. A, a lot of people now that never knew who he was, never heard of him. So, yep. well, I think you're right. I think, and not just the fans who go to the John Hartford Festival, which is known as the most laid back festival in America. And I think, in a lot of ways, you've really the the what you're talking about as far as John being kind of an ordinary person is part of what makes him so appealing and that translates to the feel of the festival and certainly um, from my own experience lots of people who attend the festival are learning about John and his music and that spirit is what's drawing them to come back again and again but even more so um, there are lots of musicians who have played that festival who have been John Hartford acolytes for their whole career but then there have been so many that didn't necessarily know of John or know uh, have dealt into his music and I've heard musician after musician uh, say now that I've discovered this it's like the thing I was looking for you know this is the person that I want to I want to grab their spirit and put that into my own music so um, I I agree with you I think the festival's doing a lot to promote uh, just the spirit that John brought to the music and the passion and then passing that on to future generations which means a legacy that will go on and on and on that John was a a wonderful entertainer. And I think if anybody uh, that is not familiar with his music, please get on YouTube or somewhere and pin John Hartford and learn a little bit about his music. If anybody got to, to see John and meet him in person, you would instantly become a friend of his. He was so open and welcoming to people. He was not ever above the fans. He was just like the fans. So that's that's about what I got to say. teacher when I went to school. She loved the river and she taught about it too. I was a pretty bad boy but she called my bluff with a great big collection of steamboat stuff. Oh yeah. She had a log books and bells and the things like that and she knew the old captains and where they were at. She rode the Alabama and the Gordon Sea Green as the Cape Girard or she was later renamed a hum. But her very favorite, as you all know, was the Golden Eagle, Captain Buck's old boat. His old stern wheeler sank and went to heaven when I was in the fourth grade in 1947. Uh-huh.
What our fashionable St. Louis society are taking a trip on the Mississippi, they sleep in their bunks with an after dinner drink. They didn't think that the boat would sink, oh no. Well, I know Captain Buck was a very sad man when that old wood hall went into the sand. And Miss Fair seemed was sad for sure, but immediately her mind went to work, oh yeah. Well, she did some politic, and that was tricky and hard, and she got the pilot house for the schoolhouse yard. And so I started of study, and I became a dreamer, a dreaming boat boats in the Mississippi River run. Cause you couldn't fool Miss Ferris none And if I went to sleep or I weren't supposed to talk Oh, she was a dead shot with a little piece of chalk on uh -huh. Oh, me, oh, my, how the time does fly Time in the river keep a rolling on by Now I'm not a student and she's not a teacher But we both still love the Mississippi River uh -huh. Well, I went to see her this Christmas last. We took a little trip back through the past. On the easy rock, and we looked at pictures and I dreamed our dreams of the Mississippi River. Uh -huh. Oh, me, oh, my, how the time does fly. Time in the river keep a rolling on by. Now I'm not a student and she's not a teacher, but we both still love the Mississippi River. So sorry there, folks, uh, that video cut a little bit short, but um, I am excited that we got to hear that part. That was archival footage of John Hartford, obviously, on a riverboat singing uh, Miss Ferris. That was a song uh, that was recorded on the Smithsonian Folkways Classic Bluegrass Volume 2. I forgot to ask John Hartfe Hart John Hotsey, who led me to that footage, um, what year he thought that was recorded in, and my guess is perhaps uh, the early 90s or so. So John Hartford there was singing about Ruth Ferris, who was his fifth grade teacher, as you heard in that song, and um, she was also one of the nation's top river historians. Um, she collected and filled her home, which was in Brentwood, with memories memorabilia and literature about the river and about steamboats. And um, much of that memorabilia is available in various libraries and museums, including our very own Missouri History Museum, which has the pilot house uh, of the Golden Eagle River boat that Ruth Ferris salvaged and had reconstructed on the school grounds of the community school in Ladue. And I was super excited to find out that this fall, the Missouri History Museum is uh, publishing a children's book about Miss Ferris called Ruth's River of Dreams. Uh, so something for us to look forward to uh, this, uh, this fall. So, um, Next up, I've got a big treat. We've got a big treat. Um, we get to hear from the wonderful Mike Compton. Um, Mike is, well, he was a member of the John Harford String Band. As you can see from this photo, that is Mike all the way there on the right in those wonderful overalls. 
Um, and uh, he, he played with John Hartford and has continued John Hartford's legacy um, through his playing. I could spend almost as much time talking about Mike Compton um, and his contribution to American folk music as I could about John Hartford. I consider him a national treasure and I am really, really honored that he took the time to participate um, in tonight's presentation by uh, making a video talking a little bit about John and then playing uh, his playing a song for you. So um, we're going to go ahead and move to that and see a Mike Compton playing on Christmas Eve and talking a little bit about John Hartford. Hey everybody, this is Mike Compton. I'm coming to you from Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Thanks for having me on your John Hartford appreciation. I understand this one is about being on the Mississippi River. I've got a song picked out I'll do for you in a little bit about being down on the Mississippi River all the way down in Louisiana on Christmas Eve. John's passion for the river, I think, in my mind, was number one, uh, even more than music, although he did draw some parallels between playing music and piloting a riverboat. Uh, one interesting one that I always remember and something that I can use is he said when you're piloting a riverboat you don't want to make big drastic moves. He said it's like just staying in the middle of the stream. You just make little adjustments here and there. It's not going really in a straight line but just sort of wiggling like that and, and staying in the current and following. He said if you don't want to make a big move and go off way off over there and then you say you'll find that SOB sideways in the river. <laughs> That's not where you want to be. But he he took that example and he he drew a parallel to music. He said when you're playing music it's it's the same way. If you're playing a phrase or, or a song, fiddle tune or something, said so you don't don't want to make a big move. You want to just make little adjustments all the way through. Uh, and uh, they'll keep you in, in the stream, so to speak. Although, John being impulsive as he was, occasionally he would uh, call out solos, not necessarily in the appointed uh, or usual place, and we would find ourselves piled up <laughs> occasionally. But it was all, all in fun, and, uh, and it was fun. Uh, and I, I miss doing it a whole lot. Let me do you this song here. It's called On Christmas Eve. Thanks again. Oh, I wanna hear 
Mike Compton there with On Christmas Eve. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for, for doing that for us. And I just appreciate all that you do to uh, perpetuate the spirit of John Hartford through your own music. Um, if y'all don't know of Mike Compton, now you know that you surely should. So you can go to MikeCompton.net to find out much, much more about him. Um, we are now here for our final piece. I am thrilled to present to you the Creek Rocks. That's Mark Ballou and Cindy Wolf. Uh, from Springfield, Missouri. They are performing one that I'm so excited that they chose to pick. They're going to perform Old Time River Man. This is an especially poignant one and one that kind of gets me every time. So we will hear from the Creek Rocks as our final piece here. And you can find out more about Mark and Cindy at thecreekrocks.com. Here they are with Old Time River Man. <laughs> Thank you. 
never come back from a quiet side was the Creek Rocks, Mark Ballou and Cindy Wolf from uh, Springfield, Missouri, uh, doing Old Tom Riverman. And that little dog that you might have noticed there sleeping to those beautiful dulcet tones, that's Peapod, in case any of y'all were wondering. So I want to say a big thank you to the Missouri Historical Society um, for featuring not only the river, but wanting to feature music about John Hartford. And also a huge thank you to John Hotze, who provided footage for me and that wonderful interview. And then Mike Compton, Betsy and Clark, and the Creek Rocks for participating as well. So, Emily. Thank you, Kelly. That was so fun. And I definitely <laughs> noticed a little peapod back there. It's so <laughs> yeah. cute. Um, we did have a couple questions, and I know you wanted to kind of uh, give the caveat that you are not necessarily the John Hartford expert, So, but I'll throw them out there. And... Um, if you can't answer them, we might be able to follow up uh, individually with people in some emails. That's a possibility that we can get some answers and get them back to you. Um, we did have somebody asking about when uh, John Hartford's final performance was. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> I know I'm going to not tell the right dates or stories. I have definitely heard stories of that, about that. Um, and I've certainly heard, I never got to see John Hartford live, which is one of the regrets of my life. But um, so many folks who did see him live, especially in those later years, talk about how he um, really was using the music to tell what was happening and what he was experiencing. And he performed right up until a few months before he passed away. And um, he had been battling cancer for quite some time. And I, I have heard a friend's story about him playing that song that we just heard, Old Time River Man, at one of his... Um, not Perhaps on his final, but at one of his fine, last performances and just how how overwhelming it was to be listening to that as he sang that in that space. So um, I know there are probably people tuned in that know far more about his final performance than I do, but I can certainly attest to the stories of, um, of what it meant for folks to be there to hear those. If there's anyone who was at his final performance, feel free to put that in the Q&A. You can type, type an answer yeah. to that. Um, somebody else just wanted to mention, um, they said the song that started it all was Gentle On My Mind. Uh, that's a great, uh, that is a great point to make. J John Hartford wrote Gentle on My Mind, which of course was made famous by Glenn Campbell and um, won four Grammys the year that it came out, which was I want to say 1968. I should have looked that up, but you can definitely Google that. Um, but uh, it won four Grammys, two of them for John Hartford and two of them for um, Glenn Campbell. And, you know, John always said that that song was the song that gave him the freedom to do everything else that he did in his career. So once he kind of had that solidified, he kind of just went and did what he loved and what he wanted to do. So um, that song did start it off. Very good point. And we actually did. The, our audiences always come through for us. We did get an answer. Um, one of our audience members says his final performance was at the Old Settlers Festival in Dripping Springs, Texas in April 2001. Um, he says Nickel Creek sat in with him and the Hartford String Band. So that's, that's super That's awesome. the answer to our question. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer. I wish I'd been there. <laughs> And I think that's all the questions we have that I can see. So um, I just want to say thank you again. Thank you to Kelly. I'm going to really quick share a slide with you so you can see some of our upcoming History Live programs that we have. Um, I'm going to try to get it into the right slide view if it'll let me. Um, it keeps wanting to do something funny here. There we go. 
So there you can see the next few programs coming up. Uh, next Tuesday, we have the story of Anna, historic wolf matriarch, with our curator of environmental life, David Lobick. Um, so be sure to join us for that and the other upcoming programs. Thank you again to Kelly. Thank you to John Hotze and all of the musicians. Thank you to all of you who are watching tonight. Really appreciate you being here for a, a really wonderful sort of nostalgic night of, of music and memories. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>